So this is part three of Roald Dahl's Danny, the Champion of the World. Cars, kites and fire balloons. My father was a fine mechanic. People who lived miles away used to bring their cars to him for repair rather than take them to the nearest garage. He loved engines. A petrol engine is sheer magic, he said to me once. Just imagine being able to take a thousand different bits of metal and if you fit them all together in a certain way and then if you feed them a little oil and a little petrol and you press a little switch, then suddenly those bits of metal will all come to life and they will purr and hum and roar. They'll make the wheels of a motor car go whizzing round at fantastic speeds. It was inevitable that I too should fall in love with engines and cars. Don't forget that even before I could walk, the workshop had become my playroom. For where else could my father have put me so that he could keep an eye on me all day long? My toys were the greasy crogs and spins, rings and pistons that lay around all over the place and these, I can promise you, were far more fun to play with than most of the plastic stuff children are given these days. So almost from birth, I began training to be a mechanic. But now I was five years old. There was a problem at school to think about. It was the law that parents must send their children to school at the age of five, and my father knew about this. We're in the workshop, I remember, on my fifth birthday, when the talk about school started. I was helping my father to fit new brake linings to the rear wheel of a big forge when suddenly he said to me, You know something interesting, Danny? You must easily be the best five-year-old mechanic in the world. This was the greatest compliment he'd ever paid me, and I was extremely pleased. You like this work, don't you, he said, all this messing about with engines. I absolutely love it, I said. He turned and faced me and laid a hand gently on my shoulder. I want to teach you to be a great mechanic, he said. And when you grow up, I hope you'll become a famous designing engineer. A man who designs new and better engines for cars and aeroplanes. For that, he added, you will need a really good education. But I don't want to send you to school quite yet. In another two years, you'll have learnt enough here with me to be able to take a small engine completely to pieces and put it together again all by yourself. And after that, after that, you can go to school. You probably think that my father was crazy trying to teach a young child to be an expert mechanic, but as a matter of fact, he wasn't crazy at all. I learnt fast and I adored every moment of it. And luckily for us, nobody ever came knocking on the door to ask why I wasn't attending school. So two more years went by and at the age of seven, believe it or not, I really could take a small engine to pieces and put it together again. I mean, properly to pieces pistons and crankshaft and all. The time had come for me to start school. My school was in the nearest village, two miles away. We didn't have a car of our own. We couldn't afford one. But the walk took only about half an hour and I didn't mind that in the least. My father came with me. He insisted on coming. And when school ended at four in the afternoon, he was always there, waiting to walk me home. And so life went on. The world I lived in consisted only of the filling station, the workshop, the caravan, the school, and of course the woods, the fields and the streams and the countryside around us. I was never bored though. It was impossible to be bored in my father's company. He was too sparky a man for that. Plots and plans and new ideas came flying off him like sparks from a grindstone. It was a good wind today, he said one Saturday morning. Just right for flying a kite. Let's make a kite, Danny. So we made a kite. He showed me how to splice four thin sticks together in the shape of a star and with two more sticks across the middle to brace it. Then we cut up an old blue shirt of his and stretched the material across the framework of the kite. We added a long tail made of thread with little leftover pieces of a shirt tied at intervals along it. We found a ball of string in the workshop and he showed me how to attach the string to the framework so that the kite would be properly balanced in flight. Together, we walked to the top of the hill behind the filling station to release the kite. I found it hard to believe that this object, made only from a few sticks and a piece of old shirt, would actually fly. I held the string 
Whilst my father held the kite, and the moment he let it go, caught by the wind, it soared upwards like a huge blue bird. Let out some more, Danny, he cried. Go on, as much as you like. And higher and higher soared the kite. Soon it was just a small blue dot dancing in the sky, miles above my head, and it was thrilling to stand there, holding on to something that was so far away and so very much alive. This faraway thing was tugging and struggling on the end of a line like a big fish. Let's walk it back to the caravan, my father said. So he walked down the hill again with me holding the string and the kite still pulling fiercely on the other end. When we came to the caravan, we were careful not to get the string tangled in the apple tree and we brought it all the way round to the front steps. Tie it up to the steps, my father said. Wait, will it stay up? I asked. It will if the wind doesn't drop, he said. And the wind didn't drop. And I'll tell you something amazing. That kite stayed up there all through the night and at breakfast time next morning, the small blue dots were still dancing and swooping in the sky. After breakfast, I hauled it down and hung it carefully against a wall in the workshop for another day. Not long after that, on a lovely still evening when there was no breath of wind anywhere, my father said to me, this is just the right weather for a fire balloon. Let's make a fire balloon. He must have planned this one beforehand because he'd already bought the four big sheets of tissue paper and the pot of glue from Mr Whitten's bookshop in the village. And now, using only the paper, the glue, a pair of scissors and a piece of thin wire, he made me a huge, magnificent fire balloon in less than 15 minutes. In the opening at the bottom, he tied a ball of cotton wool and we were ready to go. It was getting dark when we carried it outside into the field behind the caravan. We had with us a bottle of methylated spirit and some matches. I held the balloon upright while my father crouched underneath it and carefully poured a little mess onto the ball of cotton wool. Here goes, he said, putting a match to the cotton wool. Hold the sides out as much as you can, Danny. A tall yellow flame leaped up from the ball of cotton wool and went right inside the balloon. It'll catch on fire, I cried. No, it won't, he said. Watch! Between us, we held the sides of the balloon out as much as possible to keep them away from the flames in the early stages. But soon the hot air filled the balloon and the danger was over. It's nearly ready, my father said. Can you feel her floating? Yes, I said. Yes, shall we let her go? Not yet. Wait a bit longer. Wait until she's tugging to fly away. She's tugging now, I said. Right, he cried. Let her go! Slowly, majestically and in absolute silence, our wonderful balloon began to rise up into the night sky. It flies! I shouted, clapping my hands and jumping about. It flies! It flies! It flies! My father was nearly as excited as I was. It's a beauty, he said. This one's a real beauty. You never know how they're going to turn up until you fly them. Each one's different. Up and up it went, rising very fast now in the cool night air. It was like a magic fireball in the sky. Will other people see it? I asked. I'm sure they will, Danny. It's high enough now for them to see it for miles around. Well, what do they think it is, Dad? Flying saucer, my father said. They'll probably call the police. A small breeze had taken hold of the balloon and was carrying it away in the direction of the village. Let's follow it, my father said. And with luck, we'll find it when it comes down. We ran to the road. We ran along the road. We kept running. She's coming down, my father said. The flame's nearly gone out. We lost sight of it when the flame went out. But we guessed roughly which field it'd be landing in. We climbed over a gate and ran towards the place. For half an hour, we searched the fields in the darkness, but we couldn't find our balloon. The next morning, I went back alone to search again. I searched four big fields before I found it. It was lying in the corner of a field that was full of black and white cows. The cows were all standing round us and staring at it with their huge wet eyes. But they hadn't harmed it one bit. So I carried it home and hung it up alongside the kite against the wall in the workshop for another day. You can fly the kite all by yourself any time you like, my father said. But you must never fly the fire balloon unless I'm with you. It's extremely dangerous. All right, I said. Do you promise me? You'll never try to fly it alone, Danny. I promise, I said. 
Then there was a tree house which we built high up in the top of a high oak at the bottom of our field. And the bow and arrow, the bow a four foot long ash sapling, and the arrows flighted with the tail feathers of partridge and pheasant. And stilts that made me ten feet high. And a boomerang that came back and fell at my feet nearly every time I threw it. And for my last birthday, there had been something that was more fun perhaps than all the rest. For two days before my birthday, I'd been forbidden to enter the workshop because my father was in there working on a secret. And on the birthday morning, out came an amazing machine made from four bicycle wheels and several large soap boxes. But this was no ordinary whizzer. It had a brake pedal, a steering wheel, a comfortable seat and a strong front bumper to take the shock of a crash. I called it Soap Joe. And just about every day I'd take it up to the top of the hill in the field behind the filling station and come shooting down again at incredible speeds, riding it like a bronco over the bumps. So you can see that being an eight-year-old boy and living with my father was a lot of fun. But I was impatient to be nine. I reckon that being nine would be even more fun than being eight. As it turned out, I was not altogether right about this. My ninth year was certainly more exciting than any of the others, but not all of it was exactly what you would call fun. <laughs>